Hello everyone and welcome. The Porsche Taycan Turbo is currently the least efficient electric car sold in the United States according to the EPA. Now many people have been quick to defend Porsche here and say, well, what does it matter? You know, this is a car for wealthy people, Porsche enthusiasts, folks who have plenty of money, they're not going to care about efficiency, they don't need extra range if they're just driving to and from home, and those are fair points. However, there's also another very valid point about why these buyers should actually care and why people should actually care about the efficiency of the Porsche Taycan. And so that's what we're going to be discussing in this video. So first let's get some context here. Just how inefficient is the Porsche Taycan Turbo? Well, in the United States, it's rated at 69 mile per gallon equivalent or about 3.41 liters per 100 kilometers. Now this is still extremely efficient in comparison to gasoline or diesel engines. It's a very efficient vehicle. However, when you compare it to other electric cars, you start to realize how inefficient it is in comparison. So compared to the Audi e-tron, which is rated at 74 mile per gallon, equivalent and this is a vehicle that is significantly more heavy and it also has much worse aerodynamics. The Porsche Taycan Turbo has insanely good aerodynamics so it should be in theory more efficient than this Audi e-tron and yet it is not. And then comparing it to something that would kind of rival uh, the Taycan Turbo looking at the Model S long range or performance from Tesla these are rated at 111 mile per gallon equivalent or 97 mile per gallon equivalent. And so so, you know, both the Taycan Turbo and the Model S actually have very similar aerodynamics, uh, but, you know, there's going to be some efficiency differences within the drivetrain that are going to cause this difference that you see. Now, one of the differences that you'll see is a significant difference in range. So here we have the kilowatt hours of all the different battery packs. They're all fairly similar as far as the size of the battery. However, they have very different ranges. So you can see the Taycan Turbo and the Audi e-tron 201 miles or 204 miles versus the Model X up to 370 73 mile EPA rating. And so I also have the numbers here uh, which Porsche estimates for the Turbo S uh, at 68 MPGe, so the more powerful, quicker version of the Taycan, and a range of 192 miles. So significant difference between that and the Model S. Now, before you start with conspiracy theories about how the EPA numbers are somehow wrong or flawed, some research by Car and Driver provides all you need to know. Quote, Porsche says these EPA numbers are merely confirmation of the numbers that the automaker itself submitted to the agency, as is typical practice. And Porsche spokesperson Calvin Kim said that Porsche is not rebutting the EPA numbers. End quote. In other words, these are the real EPA numbers, no question. So why does the Taycan Turbo's efficiency actually matter? So we're going to look at three different categories here, being cost, range, and weight, and see how each of these might apply to a buyer who's looking to purchase a Taycan Turbo and see if it actually would matter to them. So first, looking at cost. The EPA estimates if you drive 15,000 miles per year, driving a Taycan Turbo is going to cost you about $900. $50 per year versus driving a Model S performance that is going to cost you about $700 per year. So that's only a $250 difference. But now consider the fact that over the lifetime of these cars, uh, the owner of that Taycan Turbo still could not care less that all they're losing is $250 a year uh, in order to drive the Taycan over the Model S, especially when you consider the fact that the Taycan is about double the price of a Model S. Starting at about $150 can go up to $200 pretty easily. So cost is not the reason uh, why a driver of a Taycan Turbo should care about efficiency. So how about range? Well, range actually is important, and a lot of people defend Porsche here uh, by saying, oh, you know, it doesn't matter, you're just going to drive it from home. But still, range is always a good thing. If you can have more of it, it's great to have it. If you can have less of it, it's not as great. Uh, so, you know, the fact that the Model S is almost double the range here, 373 with the long range, uh, down to 192 with the Turbo S estimated uh, on the Taycan, so a significant difference in range, and if you really do want to go on a road trip, Obviously the Model S is going to be better for it because you'll have longer time between stops. The Taycan can charge very quickly, the Model S can charge very quickly. If you're just driving it from home, you don't need you know, those 200 miles of range and you're always charging at home, you don't need it for road trips, yep, the Taycan will do you just fine. And if you do need it for the occasional road trip, it'll probably be able to squeak it out. It's just going to be not quite as convenient as the Model S. Again, I don't think that's the huge reason here why efficiency is so important on this Taycan Turbo. 
All right, so now let's get into weight because this is where things start to really fall apart for the Porsche. So the Porsche Taycan Turbo weighs 5,132 pounds. Now I have two other vehicles here to compare against. The Model S Long Range, which weighs 4,883, also a very heavy vehicle. And then a Shelby GT500, which we're using to prove uh, that people don't care about efficiency with gasoline vehicles. And I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, but this vehicle weighs 4,171 pounds also extremely heavy for a sports car. So all of these extremely heavy, looking at this Porsche Turbo, over 5,000 pounds. This is over 1,000 pounds heavier than a base Ford F-150. That is insane. This is not good. There is nothing about this number that is good. So we should never be like, ah, oh, you know, it's fine that the Porsche Turbo weighs way more than a pickup truck. That is insane. Five thousand pounds. This isn't good. And the big reason for this uh, is that this is an electric vehicle. And so its battery weighs 1,389 pounds, which is a lot of weight. Now, compared to the Model S long range, this is not a light vehicle. So we're not here to just say, oh, the Model S did great. The reason why the Model S here gets an excuse is because it has so much range. So it's very heavy, because it goes very far. The Porsche is very heavy because it's not efficient. And that's the downside here. So if you start to do a little bit of the math just to say, okay, well, what if I wanted a Porsche Taycan Turbo that could travel as far as a Model S long range? We take the range of the long range, divide it by the range of the Porsche Taycan Turbo, subtract one from that, multiply it by its battery weight. This gives you a rough little estimate, about 1,200 additional pounds to add to that Taycan Turbo. So if you wanted to have an equivalent weight or an equivalent range to the Tesla Model S long range, the Porsche Taycan Turbo would weigh about 6,000. 321 pounds. And yes, there's some assumptions that go along with this that the vehicle wouldn't actually need to be larger and you're just adding battery within it. Uh, but regardless, if the Taycan wanted to move as far as the Model S, it would weigh an insane amount, 6,321 pounds. So this is why, this is why it is not good that the Taycan Turbo is so inefficient because, because it's inefficient, if they want to have any sort of useful range, the battery has to be massive and the vehicle has to be extremely heavy. Now, why doesn't this matter? Why do we not care that the GT500 gets 14 miles per gallon? So why is it fair for internal combustion engines to be super inefficient while it isn't fair for an electric car, an electric sports car, to be super inefficient? Well, if you look at uh, this GT500, which weighs 4,171 pounds, already about 1,000 pounds less than the Taycan Turbo, it only gets 14 miles per gallon combined rating, and it has a 16 gallon tank, which means it's only good for 224 miles. It does have a rather pitiful range. People are willing to forgive this though because you can fill up the tank really quickly uh, and efficiency isn't as important here. But the other big thing with this is that let's say Ford said, you know what, we want the range of our GT500 to match that of a Tesla Model S long range for whatever reason. Let's say they wanted to do it. Well, you take uh, the range of the Model S long range, you subtract from it the range of the GT500, you divide it by its MPG, 14 MPG, that gives you 10.6 gallons extra that you would need. One gallon of gasoline weighs about 6.3 pounds. So you do the math and that works out to about 67 additional pounds of weight by fuel that you would have to add to the GT500 in order to match the range of the Tesla here. And of course, yes, you'd have to have a fuel tank as well and the extra space for it, but really you're adding 70 pounds in order to match the range here. Whereas for this vehicle, you're adding 1,200 pounds. So adding range to an electric car is very difficult to do because it makes that car heavy. And doing so to a gasoline car isn't that big of a deal, even if it's only getting 14 miles per gallon. So that's the big thing that I want people to take away from this. Uh, efficiency in electric cars is extremely important. And the reason being is because the less efficient it is, the more it's going to have to weigh in order to have a decent range. Now, efficiency isn't the only reason why the Taycan has less range. Part of it has to do with their battery strategy. And it's actually pretty interesting to compare the different strategies that different companies are using when it comes to their batteries. So with the Taycan Turbo, it has a 93.4 kilowatt hour battery, but they block off about 12% of that uh, from the driver. So you're only able to access about 83.7 kilowatt hours. Now, the reason they do this is to promote the longevity of the battery. If you're constantly charging a battery 
all the way to the very top, it starts to degrade that battery much more quickly than if you only use that center range there. And so that's the strategy they're taking where they cut you out from using that extra range and this promotes longevity. It also means it's going to make it easier for them to, you know, meet their battery warranty. Of course, they have to have this thing last eight years uh, before it really starts to degrade in order for it to maintain that warranty. And so the driver won't notice any range difference because even as this battery starts to degrade, you've got that 12% that it can diminish and you won't notice that your battery has actually gotten worse. So that's the, the benefit of going with this strategy. The downside being, you know, assuming this rating comes from the 83.7 kilowatt hours, you know, if you were to use the 93.4, you would actually get more range, about 225 miles instead of 201. Now, this is quite different than the strategy which Tesla takes, which basically just says, here's the battery, do what you want with it. Now, Tesla understands that the longevity of this battery is dependent on how high you charge it, which is why if you go into the screen, it will say, hey, we don't recommend charging past 90% unless you're taking this thing on a trip. But the advantage there is that you get a little bit extra a range uh, you can charge it up to 100% if you are going to go on a trip and you need that extra capacity so the disadvantage here is that you're really relying on the consumer to make smart choices and you know some of us are kind of dumb so we might make the wrong choices so by going with Tesla strategy it's a bit more risky because let's say everyone just charges their battery to 100% constantly well that's probably going to give them some more warranty issues versus a strategy like this where you're keeping it in that safe zone and you don't have to worry about the consumer doing something dumb with your battery so you know it's slightly more risky strategy it's more dependent on the consumer I like that it gives you know me the choice rather than uh, blocking me out so I, I kind of do like like this strategy, but I get why both happen. Now, another reason why Porsche chooses to block off some of that battery is that they have a very different regen strategy versus Tesla. And so when you're on the brake in the Porsche, you will actually use regen braking. So meaning you're using the motors to slow the vehicle down rather than the mechanical brakes. In the Tesla, the brake pedal is purely for mechanical brakes. It does not get the motor involved. So your accelerator pedal is what's changing whether or not the motors are involved in DC acceleration on the Tesla Model S. On the Taycan, your accelerator pedal is used to move you forward. If you lift off of it, it's basically going to coast. So you're always going to have a consistent feel in your accelerator pedal. This brake pedal can regen up to 265 kilowatts. Uh, Porsche says up to 0.39 Gs of deceleration. It can use that energy and put it back into the battery pack. And Porsche says this is not state of charge or temperature dependent. So because they have this battery buffer, there's always space to charge up a little more. Whereas let's say you're in the Tesla, you're at 100% and you're trying to slow down. Well, you can't use regen because you're already at 100%. There's no more energy that you can put into the battery pack. And so as a result, in the Tesla Model S, your accelerator pedal feel will change depending on state of charge. Fully charged, you're not gonna have much regen. Even as it starts to go down to 90%, you'll still have some reduced regen. By the time you get to 80%, then you can start to have full regen but it's also temperature dependent with the Tesla. So if it's really cold outside, you're not gonna have much regen. So what all of this amounts to is, again, Tesla's kind of putting it all into the driver's hands to figure this out, rather than making everything feel the exact same always. So the driving experience in the Tesla Model S, the accelerator pedal will feel very different as you lift off, depending on the battery's temperature and depending on the battery's state of charge. So that's a big difference uh, versus Taycan, which is choosing the strategy of the brake pedal always feels exactly the same, the accelerator pedal always feels exactly the same. I think part of the benefit uh, of this Porsche strategy and why they're able to get away with high regen even in colder temperatures, not only being that the battery is reduced in charge, but also by using that 800 volt system uh, versus the Tesla, which is at about a 350 volt system. So this is kind of, you know, the, the like mainstream strategy of make everything always feel the same always. This is the, the driver probably understands their vehicle really well and they will do the right thing strategy. So, you know, it can be concerning uh, in the Model S of, hey, I let off my accelerator pedal and it's not slowing the vehicle down at all. If you're not used to that and you don't know why it's happening, you won't have that happen in the Taycan. It's always going to feel the same. The benefit of this system, which I really like, is it allows you to have one pedal driving. So again, both strategies here make sense. I get why both do them and there are advantages and disadvantages to each.
Now, it has been fascinating learning about the strategy of this Porsche Taycan Turbo, and actually there's some really cool things about it. So I'm gonna be making an additional video talking about just how quick I think this thing is going to be, uh, which I'm looking forward to. So thank you all so much for watching, and if you have any questions or comments, of course, feel free to leave those below.